Dr. Mark Albion served for more than 20 years as a student, administrator, and marketing professor at Harvard Business School. He co-founded six organizations, including Net Impact, a community with more than 50,000 student and professional leaders that supports a new generation looking to use their careers to drive transformational change in the workplace and the world. As he approached mid-career, Mark made the decision that there was more to living than the quest for money, power, and fame. His subsequent reflections on responsible career decision-making have seen him write seven books and over 200 articles. He's been recognized as a New York Times best-selling author and has officially represented the U.S. at the United Nations, where he outlined the importance of developing socially responsible global leaders. He was profiled on 60 Minutes and has been hugged by, Mother, by Ronald Reagan, Mother Teresa, and me. I mention this not least for the opportunity it provides me to be included in the same sentence as Mother Teresa and Ronald Reagan. Known to his due daughters and wife as the man who rode across Afghanistan on horseback, Mark is a person as true to himself as anyone I've ever met. I consider myself privileged to have met and to have been inspired by him. I'm delighted that he's agreed to share his thoughts with us this morning. Please welcome Dr. Mark Albion. Well, it's so nice. You know, it's nice at my age not to have to wait for your eulogy to hear these nice words. You know, really great. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Thank you, Dr. Bell, old friend, and David Boyd. And I'd like to thank Dean Labrie uh, and all the faculty and officials here at Northeastern for having me back. I'm a Boston strong boy. I've spent 60 of my 63 years here, and we're here to honor you today, and I'm so happy to be part of that process, and for the first time to be here and not at a hockey game. So uh, I almost wore my skates, but uh, decided not to. Uh, just to get us started off, congratulations to you, clearly. Um, I'd also like, like to thank for being here my wife, who is up there. Um, she doesn't come to a lot of my things. She, uh, whenever I write a new piece, she says, oh, I've, I, you know, I've seen that before. It's the same thing you've been writing for years, which is all about how we can each, uh, we all dream of noble purposes, every one of us, just like Elizabeth McClellan is doing. And uh, it's an honor to follow her as well, and I know we're, you're waiting to get your degree, so I'll try to finish speaking before you finish listening, okay, and, and, and move this along. But in getting married, I think one of the real lessons I learned was the lesson of that it's, it's not so much important to marry or have a partner who is a person you want to live with. It's the, to marry the person you can't live without. Thank you, Joy. It's going to be a good day. Can we get everybody to stand up for a moment, please, before we get started? I, it, this is really a stretch break. There's nothing, nothing going, a little, you know, a little stretch break. I learned this from my old friend, uh, Tony Robbins. I think just it's a pr pretty good time to do this. And uh, I obviously want to congratulate all of you, uh, ranging in age, I believe uh, the dean was saying to me, uh, up to 63. We have a graduate here my age, which is just wonderful. I want to congratulate all of you. And could you all sit down except for the families and the parents? in particular, and let's give a whole a hand to the families and parents who have supported you through all these years. <laughs> Woo! So in the uh, interest of being brief, uh, let me give you the biggest piece of advice I can give you today for my 63 years. I'm a, I'm a journeyman just like you are just trying to find my way. Uh, as Elizabeth was talking about, none of us have grand plans, but today I'm gonna try to give you sort of five pointers, two don'ts and, two, and three do's, on trying to live a life, not a resume, trying to live a full life. And as I like to say, it's not about what the market wants, it's not about what your skills are, it's about what makes you come alive. And, but first of all, it's a tough world out there now. We all know that, I'm not gonna detail that it's raining. As we say, build me an ark. Don't tell me that it's gonna rain. Build me an ark. And it is a tough world, so the best piece of advice I can give to you with your wonderful families here and your parents is to live off your parents as long as you can. <laughs> I'm still trying. My, my mother is 86 years old and still around, and I'm still trying to do that. But no, more seriously, 
Um, I'd like to go through for you, as I say, five pointers in a brief period of time. I call them lifelines to try to help you live a fulfilling life, of which a resume is part of it, but it's only part. As we all know, life involves many more things than that. Family, for example, is a way of holding hands with forever. Family is the country of the heart. Uh, a student, I'm writing my eighth book right now, and I had a student comment and said, family is not a noun, it's a verb. An important message today, and again, I, I learn from so many of you, that's where I get all my good material. I like to say as a writer that when you steal from one person, that's plagiarism. When you steal from many people, that's good research. So I, I like to say, you know, it is, a, it is a verb, and that's an important part of the message today, that we're talking about living a full life. And achievement and success, as we traditionally define it, is part of that, and an important part, as we'll recognize today. But it's only a part of it. And all of it requires your effort and energy, and it's too easy for a lot of us, including myself, to put so much energy into our work that we forget about putting energy into holding hands with forever, our families, in other parts of our life, and our own spiritual life as well. So I just urge you to think about that today as we go out into this challenging world, particularly a world I think you're well suited for, given the great institution you go to. I, I've known of Northeastern, of course, for many years. David Boyd, I've been over here to speak a number of times, and I am an honor to be here today. And Northeastern not only has the great co-op program, which is the way we've known it for years, but particularly in the last five or ten years, has tremendously developed, as you know, the international programs and rocketed, I think, up the rankings faster than any other university around. And I've been to about 600 universities speaking, and I'm absolutely honored and just incredibly impressed with what Northeastern has done over the last decade. So let me try to give you these sort of uh, five lifelines, as I call them, and illustrate them by telling you a little, about, a little bit about me. Now, I'm a guy, so I love to talk about myself, so bear with me, okay? Uh, first of all, the central question of my life is how can I be a Marxist? and still own my own jacuzzi. Now, what I mean by that, I'm not a Marxist, but what I mean by that, I grew up in the 60s, and I always want to have a social impact. Like all of you, I dream of noble purposes, too. Oh, I, I don't know if that's good or bad. What do you think? Um, and growing up in the 60s, but I also want to be able to, and we do actually have our own jacuzzi, it just so happens, but I want to be able to make a living, too. I not only want to make a life by what I give, but a living by what I uh, make a uh, living by what I get, but I want to make a life by what I give. So how do I really integrate and balance those two? It's very challenging. As the Chinese like to say, if you want to walk a straight line in life, you first fall off to the left, and then you fall off to the right. It's a challenging, ongoing journey of life. So what are sort of the five things that I've learned that I'd like to share with you today? The first two things are don'ts. Don't get really good at what you don't want to do. I call it the bobblehead. Yeah, I can see some heads going up and down. Thank you. Oh, yeah. And believe me, every saint's been a sinner. Every sinner's been a saint. I've, I've done these things as well. That's how I learned about them and learned about them from you. And the second is don't live a deferred life plan. And let, you give, let me give you my example. Uh, growing up, uh, actually a critical part of my life before that, was an aha moment that I had 17 years ago when my, at that time, uh, youngest daughter, who was six years old, did a drawing of me. And in that drawing was a picture of what daddy loves to do. What is it that makes daddy come alive? And at the time, I was running my own little small social enterprise, trying to help students, as you heard through Net Impact, uh, find a path of service and do it in a way that they can make a good living. And the picture, depicted me as a guy with a big head, a big mouth, you can see that now, right? A stubby little body, okay? And by the way, she gave me a lot of hair. You give me a lot of hair, you can say or do anything you want about me. And she said, she had me next to what she called my pewter, pewter. She meant my computer. And she said, what does daddy love to do? Daddy loves to type. He loves to type. And you know, that may sound like nothing to you, but I hadn't really thought about it. And within the next month, true story, I went up into the attic of our house and found a box. And in that box 
was a whole group of short stories that I had written when I was about her age, about seven or eight years old. Instead of having a paper route, I used to write one and two page stories and sell them door to door. All right? Three cents for one copy, five cents for a two page copy. All right? And then what did I hear from my parents and the voices out there? They said, well, Mark, that's great, but you can't make a living being a writer. No, oh, okay, so I can't be a writer. Well, let me try something else. So at that time, I set up what I called my little Lucy stand. I don't know how many of you know Peanuts. It's a little bit old now. But it was an advice stand where I gave advice to my friends on how to get along better with their siblings. By the way, I had no siblings myself at that time. <laughs> so, you know, that was great, five cents. My parents were very excited about that. And they said, this is wonderful, Mark. You want to become a psychiatrist. I said, well, no, I really don't want to be a doctor. You know, ugh. Of course, I'm Jewish. Whatever your religion, ethnicity, this is very common. You're not a viable fetus, a viable person until you become a lawyer or a doctor. That's sort of the deal. I said, no. In fact, what I want to become, and please don't say these words to your parents. They're real killers. I know as a parent myself. Two words. I want to become a social worker. Well, the truth is, as I went on another path, which I'll talk about briefly as we go along to the to-dos, those are really the two things I ended up incorporating in my life. But I got good at things I didn't want to do. I was very good at math, so I got pretty good at business. I had a great job. I became what I call a conflicted achiever and was able to you know, make a very good living. But I just, I just felt my soul was being sucked out of me every day because I saw business differently than most of my friends. I saw business as a way to uplift the human spirit in a way to alleviate some of the poverty and suffering we have on our planet. And I wanted to play a some part in that bigger story. So in terms of these two, two sort of rules, let me explain to you what is it that stops us? If you don't already know, you probably do. Very, very quickly, what is it that makes us do things we don't want to do or defer our life plan? And by the way, I got that expression from a uh, Warren Buffett speech where Mr. Buffett was asked by a student how about this for my life plan, Mr. Buffett? I'm going to go out and work and make a lot of money for 10 years, and then I'm going to go and do what I really, really, really want to do. What do you think about that, Mr. Buffett? Hmm, 10 years and then. So Mr. Buffett said, well, Sonny, you know, it seems to me like you're saving up sex for old age. What are you waiting for? And it doesn't mean that we don't plan, but we don't only plan. Well, why do we do these things? Two big reasons. The first one I like to say, and I get this from my father who just quickly uh, is the 70th anniversary of D-Day for all of us, not just for Americans, in terms of those who fight to protect our freedoms. He was at Normandy and was shot down twice during the war. I honor him. He has passed away seven years ago. And he had an expression that all great things begin in poetry but end in real estate. He was in real estate, and in fact, during the war, on his 35 missions in the air, he carried around with him a British and American poetry book. But the bottom line is money doesn't talk, it swears. It's a critical part of our life. And that can make us make decisions at different times that maybe aren't the best decisions for us, but we feel at that time that is, that's an excuse that we often use to not really take those risks and chances to live a full life, living a life, not just a resume. And the second thing that holds us back is VOJs. Those are voices of judgment. They start with our parents who want the best for us. And I think what happens is we feel that we have to follow in the footsteps of our parents. But I think what we really have to do is honor their values. I have a lot of friends in business. One in particular is Lovemore Mugabe. Lovemore is a South African business person, originally from Zimbabwe. And his parents were very, very famous doctors in Southern Africa and Lovemore became a business person. They were very disappointed. But Lovemore, in his business, he trains a lot of Kellogg Foundation fellows, works with a lot of small social enterprises, and mentors a lot of young people. And over the years, his parents has respected the fact that he, too, uses his gifts, and in his case, his enterprises, to, as I say, to create a world of more social and economic justice to try to heal the world. Now, again, there's also then after parents, there's a lot of peer pressure. What does society want us to do? And those voices are tough. In fact, one of the best interviews I ever have, I interview a lot of people, is I interviewed a 104-year-old woman once, 
and I asked her, what's the best thing about being 104? I said, well, Mark, I have no peer pressure. <laughs> so listening to our little voice and not getting really good at what we don't want to do and deferring life plans are tough, and those hold us back. So let me give you three of what I call lifelines about how to get on track, and maybe you're doing a lot of these already, but I just want to reaffirm partially what you don't know and uh, reaffirm partially what you do know and maybe offer some things you haven't heard before. Basically, in order to get on track, the three lifelines I use are turn your values into value, surround yourself with a community of love, and know how to measure success, how you measure success. And that's really the big one. All of my writing and work over the years um, has been really about that, is really rethinking and broadening our definition of what success means to us. And it's an ever-changing, ever-moving sort of position. As I like to say, it's a, it's a process. Like a lot of people say, I want to climb to the top of the mountain. I say life is more about getting to the bottom of the mountain. It's about getting started. It's about getting there. It's about playing the game of life. So in terms of those three things, for me, what were my values? My values were caring about trying to make a difference and finding, it wasn't so much I didn't want to be a professor and administrator, but finding people or the part of people, students, who also wanted to do that. I got myself into a community called the Net Impact Community where I met young people who literally blew me away. People like yourself I couldn't believe, people like Elizabeth, who were really doing special things at an age where I, I used to say I was just really sort of sucking my thumb. And also, they had their own definitions of success. Their success definitions involved usually a lot more than just them. I met people in the southern part of Africa who followed what's called Ubuntu. If you don't know what Ubuntu is, it's, it's an African spirituality of a way you live your life, which is that you become a person through other people. The community comes first. Personal development is not even an issue because it's the community that helps you find your gifts. In fact, if you were going to visit Mr. Mandela when he was alive, you didn't visit and honor him. You honored Kunu and Trans K, the community and townships that he was from. And that's what a lot of these students were doing, people like yourselves. And by the way, today we have more professionals than students and more non-MBAs than MBAs. We have 50,000 members, as Kevin said, uh, here basically in the US, and we have about one and a half million people who are involved in the organization every year. So we're in about 60-odd countries, not like the 90 countries of North, uh, Northeastern. But we are trying to develop these communities where people are defining the success differently in terms of how they live their life. And they've really taught me. In particular, I remember one guy who came from uh, Portland area. His name was T.J. McIntyre. And T.J. in 1993 came to me after I, I spoke out at uh, the University of Oregon, which is in Eugene. And he said, I want to have a conference on sustainability. I said, what the heck is sustainability? I never even heard of it. And he talked to me, and I said, I can't even help you. You know, really, I don't know very much about it. And good luck, and you know, if you want me to contact a few people, I'll try. Well, in his first year, he was an MBA. At the end of his first year, in Eugene, Oregon, which is about, what, two hours outside of Portland, T.J. McIntyre got 3,000 academics and students to come to Eugene to discuss sustainability. The power of an individual, one person, what a difference one person can make. And that's what's really inspired me. So for you and my best wishes for you in this coming, coming uh, part of your life, which I'm sure will be very exciting and challenging, my best wishes for you I'd like to end with is a poem, a brief poem from Kabir who is a wonderful Hindu mystic poet, who once said, when you were born, you cried, and the world rejoiced. Live, you live, live your life so that when you die, the world cries and you rejoice. Many blessings, Godspeed.